Good afternoon. My name is Rita Tremblay. I'm the Vice President Academic and Provost at the University of Victoria. It's with great delight that I welcome all of you to the University of Victoria, to Congress 2013, and to our community. I want to extend a special welcome to Louise Arbor, who, as you all know, is one of our eminent speakers on our Big Thinking Speaker Series. I would also like to welcome all Congress delegates and our community members. The University of Victoria resides on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish and Strait Salish people, and I wish to acknowledge with respect their history, customs, and culture. Congress is an annual event which brings together scholarly associations and provides an opportunity for academics, researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to share findings, refine ideas, and build partnerships which will help us shape of Canada of today and tomorrow. We are all very proud to host Congress 2013 during our 50th anniversary event. In fact, Congress is the culminating event, academic event here, and the biggest event for the university celebrations. From September 2012 to June 2013, UVic has been celebrating its 50th anniversary. Celebrations that highlight our long and distinguished educational record, starting as Victoria College in 1903, when first and second year arts and science courses from Montreal's McGill universities were offered. In 1920, Victoria College became affiliated with the University of British Columbia. 50 years ago, for UVic, the 1960s has been a great period of transformation. The institution has moved from Victoria College to a university, establishing its own identity, attracting the best faculty, doing an excellent research, and really providing in programs which really serve our community, both locally, nationally, and internationally. Since then, we have been recognized as a top university by national and international publications. Recently, the university was recognized as an international leader in a broad mix of academic fields by the 2013 QS World University Rankings. We've been recognized by, in the top 1% of universities in the world by the Leiden Rankings, and Times Higher has placed us, placed UVic in top 11 and in the world and first in Canada among universities which are 50 years or younger. These achievements confirm University of Victoria's research performance and impact on the national and international scale. It's no surprise, therefore, that our anniversary period has been full of events and historical reflections, culminating in all the activities that Congress 2013 has to offer. And we are pleased to host colleagues from across the country, from our local community at large, to join in our celebration. The theme of this year's Congress is At the Edge, which not only reflects University of Victoria's location on the west coast of Canada, but it is also about testing the boundaries of disciplines, promoting innovative thinking, seeking relevance to both local and global communities, and committing to engaged scholarship and knowledge mobilization. Our theme focuses on the key social challenges of inequality, the need for inclusivity, and the acceptance of diversity to ensure voices of the margins are heard. This afternoon, you will hear from Louise Arbor, and I invite you to enjoy the speech which touches on inequalities in an interconnected world. I also extend an invitation to all of you to participate in all of the other Congress 2013 activities. Once, then, once again, welcome to University of Victoria, and welcome to Congress 2013. Thank you. Je m'appelle Gilles Patry et je suis le président directeur général de la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation. Permettez-moi de vous dire à quel point je suis heureux 
d'être ici aujourd'hui pour vous présenter, Mme Louise Arbour, notre première conférencière dans la série « Voir grand ». I am honored to be here today to introduce Mme Louise Arbour, our first speaker in the Big Thinking series here at Congress 2013. But before I begin, I want to relay how pleased we are at the Canada Foundation for Innovation to support this series. At the Foundation, we like to say that research builds communities. And these big thinking conferences highlight the kinds of research and issues that get to the heart of matters, that what matters to people in communities across Canada and really communities around the world. The work of Louise Arbour is no exception. Madame Arbour is currently the president and CEO of the International Crisis Group, an international anti-conflict, non-profit, non-governmental organization. Madame Arbour is also the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, a former Justice of the Supreme Court and of the Court of Appeal of Ontario, and a former Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. De 2004 à 2008, Madame Arbour a occupé le poste de Haut Commissaire des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme. Il n'est que de prendre connaissance de la description de ses fonctions pour en mesurer l'extrême exigence. Son rôle consistait à promouvoir et à protéger les droits humains et la dignité inhérente à tous les peuples partout et en tout temps. Madame Arbour has remarked of her role over the years, and I quote, my powers are few, my limitations are many, end of quote. Yet her personal powers, tenacity, honesty, and courage have enabled her to take on the most imposing human rights obstacles, indifference, corruption, incompetence, and greed. Madame Arbour's inspiring human rights agenda has been buoyed by recognition within the United Nations that every nation state has a responsibility to protect its own citizen. And this responsibility to protect is linked to the conviction stated clearly in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that the right to life is the supreme human right, a right upon which all others are based. Louise Arbour argues that universal respect for this basic right is a critical component of a more just, peaceful, and safer world. Si elle est réaliste en ce qui a trait aux moyens, Louise Arbour demeure résolument idéaliste en ce qui a trait aux fins qu'elle veut atteindre. Grâce à sa tenacité, elle a su nous montrer à de multiples reprises que ces résultats souhaités étaient à notre, étaient à, à notre portée. Et si le monde aujourd'hui est, me, si aujourd est meilleur, c'est en partie à ses efforts et à son énergique volonté que nous le devons. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Madame Louise Arbour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I'm extraordinarily impressed to see you sitting in the dark on the day that has more sunshine than I've seen in the past three weeks as I live in Brussels. So congratulations to you, um, I think, for the opening of what promises to be an excellent Congress. I wish I could uh, stay and I would happily sit in the dark as well to listen to many of the other speakers who are going to uh, be coming in the course of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, as I was preparing notes for this talk, I came across an article in the International Herald Tribune which was covering the launch of the new Mercedes S-Class. For a starting price of about $100,000, you can now buy a vehicle that almost drives itself. It has Wi-Fi internet access. It has cup holders that will keep your drink either hot or cold as you wish. 
and it has a hot stone massage option built in into the reclining rear seats. It monitors your level of fatigue and veers away from pedestrians and other vehicles if you fail to do so. At the same time, uh, tech geeks are apparently working, as I understand, on um, eyeglasses that will allow you to walk around the world reading everything you see in a language you'll understand. And there I was thinking that amazing technological advances were the preserve of the military. All this, I think, is truly amazing. Now, meanwhile, people in Syria are dying by the tens of thousands before our very eyes, and so far there doesn't seem to be very much that can or is being done about it. Now, in juxtaposing these two observations about Syria and about the Mercedes uh, S-Class vehicle, one could draw all kinds of inferences. An obvious one might be that wealthy consumerism rather than necessity, is the true mother of many inventions. Actually, the observation that interests me, however, is how today's international peace and security infrastructure seems antiquated and underperforming in an era of unprecedented human ingenuity. The Security Council of the United Nations, the ultimate guardian of peace, is proving particularly impotent in the face of the war in Syria, whose increasing ferocity was all too predictable. Maybe when we all have cars that drive themselves, we won't need traffic cops, but for now we need peace cops. We need them more than ever, but frankly, they're nowhere to be seen. I'm speaking to you today, as was mentioned, as the president of International Crisis Group, a non-governmental organization, which was set about almost two decades ago uh, in the Balkans with a mission to prevent, uh, mitigate, and resolve deadly conflict. We work in some 40 countries in the world's most troubled spots, from Syria to Afghanistan, Mali to the Gulf of Guinea, and Central America. Our fundamental approach is that you need to understand a conflict to resolve it. Our work is rooted in field research. Our analysts are usually amongst the world's most prominent experts on the conflict that they cover. They look for the root causes of conflict. They look for the factors that are at work, whether these factors are political, economic, cultural, or personal. Uh, they look for the main actors that are involved and what or who influences them. They look for potential triggers of violence and for opportunities for mitigation or resolution of conflict. Based on their analysis, we develop targeted prescriptions for action. We set forth in reports, of which we publish scores every year. Uh, we publish and we analyze what needs to happen, when, how, and by whom. And then we try to persuade, sometimes in public, sometimes privately, the relevant actors to align their interest in support of a broader international public interest in peace and security for all. Now, clearly, much of our attention at the moment is focused on the crisis in Syria. We've published some 10 reports since the crisis started almost two years ago. We've anticipated and documented its tragic descent as peaceful process for political freedom morphed, mostly thanks to the Assad regime's brutal and inept response, into a horrific civil war involving extraordinary cruelty by the regime, indiscriminate shelling, including with ballistic missiles of residential neighborhoods, whole families butchered by sectarian militias in shocking mass murders, regular torture and killing of detainees, including in some cases women and children. This savagery has catalyzed opposition violence, despite attempts within the rebellion to resist radicalization. Al-Qaeda-type groups fueled with money from the Gulf are now amongst the most powerful of those within a disparate alliance opposing the Assad regime. Some of those groups have now themselves perpetrated many atrocities. According to the United Nations, the death toll currently stands at about 80,000, and that's probably an estimate uh, that is quite conservative. By the end of this year, aid agencies predict that there will be 3.6 million refugees and 6 million in need inside the country, 
This is out of a population of some 23 million people. Even these almost surreal numbers cannot accurately portray the cost for Syrian society. Very few Syrians remain untouched by the death of someone they know. Mounting evidence that chemical weapons have been used is the latest twist to this ghastly confrontation. Syria's tragedy threatens to drag down its neighbors. Iraq is itself suffering a dangerous rise in sectarian violence, with fault lines mirroring very closely those in Syria. Jordan uh, has been facing an influx of refugees and fears attempts by the Assad regime to export its war. Turkey also hosts many refugees, straining its ability to provide for them in distorting sensitive ethnic and sectarian balances in Atay province. In recent weeks, Turkish officials have blamed the Syrian regime for deadly bomb blasts within Turkish territory. Perhaps even more dangerously, Lebanon is now deeply implicated in the Syrian war, as we've documented in a recent report, first by having to absorb an extraordinary influx of Syrian refugees amounting to close to a quarter of the population of Lebanon, and then more importantly by cross-border skirmishes and the involvement of Lebanese Sunni Islamists supporting the rebels on one side, and the increased involvement of Hezbollah, which backs the Assad regime on the other side. In Hezbollah's case, what began as relatively minor and targeted help over time has now expanded into what now seems to be a comprehensive, full-fledged, and ever more overt military support. Israeli airstrikes, which are, according to Israel, aimed at preventing Iranian weaponry from reaching Hezbollah, also signaled the danger of the conflict's regionalization. Now, how has the international community responded to the gravest threat to peace and security today? Well, the scorecard is pretty bleak. Despite the conflict's already horrendous cost, and despite the risk that it will engulf the entire region, outside players, especially major powers, still appear unwilling to agree among themselves on how to help Syrians find a solution. For its part, the UN Security Council is completely paralyzed by a dispute between the US, the UK, and France, the so-called P3, on the one hand, and China and Russia on the other side. This, this standoff poisons every meeting of the, uh, the Council on the Syrian crisis and has limited the response of the Council to impotent statements condemning the violence. The second UN envoy to Syria, Lakdar Brahimi, followed his predecessor, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, in attempting against all odds to broker a political solution. Both um, Kofi Annan and Brahimi are amongst the world's most seasoned negotiators and peacemakers, but even they have been so far unable to make headway without more active support from the big powers. Worse still, while the Assad regime brutal crackdown of peaceful process lies at the root of this crisis, the action of major global and regional powers have done a great deal to escalate it. Without the political cover and logistical aid from Russia, Assad probably would have been forced to compromise. Without the shallow displays of Western outrage in the early days of the uprising, and the precedent of international military invo involvement in Libya, to which I'll return in a moment, protesters might have thought twice about taking up arms. The opposition's regional allies, notably in the Gulf, provide it with enough cash and weapons to keep fighting, but not enough for it to defeat the regime, even assuming that they could. So even as interference from all sides increases, it remains thus far indecisive. As one of our experts recently noted, no negotiated end to the conflict is in sight, precisely because all players and all their foreign backers believe they can, must, and will prevail militarily. Now, the Security Council's division and in inaction in Syria contrasts very sharply with the role of the Security Council during the Libyan crisis. 
Their two peaceful process, protests very quickly morphed into armed conflict, largely due to a crackdown by then President Muammar Gaddafi. In Libya's case, however, as Gaddafi advanced on the rebel stronghold of Benghazi, the Security Council, rather than merely lamenting the violence, referred the situation of Libya to the International Criminal Court and acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, authorized the use of all necessary measures, both to enforce a no-fly zone and, quote, to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat. Now, many hailed that Security Council resolution as proof of the growing international recognition of the responsibility to protect, now commonly called R2P. This doctrine, as many of you may know, emerged from the Canadian-sponsored International Commission on State Sovereignty and Intervention, and that doctrine was endorsed by the United Nations General Assembly in 2005. This doctrine asserts that states are responsible for protecting their populations against mass atrocities, while the international community is responsible for assisting them. And it provides that if a state proves unwilling or unable to discharge that primary obligation, then the international community has the responsibility to intervene, including, if necessary, through coercive force under the authority of the United Nations. Now, the Libya resolution might have only squeaked through, and then only, uh, largely because of Libya's geopolitics. Uh, First, the support for a strong intervention came from the Arab League, where Gaddafi had very few allies. Uh, and without this endorsement, the Security Council members might have voted very differently. Second, of course, Gaddafi's very low international, personal international standing, even outside the region, played very much in favor of a consensus for action. So did the weak and fractured Libyan military, which didn't seem to pose much of a threat uh, to NATO military might. And to some extent, the precedent and the optimism of the other Arab uprisings also um, were felt as a call for action. Still, for the proponent of the resolution, the Security Council was finally preventing a dictator uh, perpetrating a massacre of his own citizen while uh, trying to hide behind the protective shield of state sovereignty. This optimism, however, proved very short-lived. Reaching beyond the threat to Benghazi, NATO's pursuit of a military campaign that led to Gaddafi's killing and the collapse of his regime proved very divisive. Members of the Security Council, including Russia and China, but also other powerful emerging, democ emerging powerful democracies in the global south, India, Brazil, and South Africa, who were on the Security Council at the time, and probably would be permanent members of the Security Council if this institution was properly reformed, all of them argued that NATO misused its civilian protection mandate to pursue a political agenda of regime change. They point to uh, the Gaddafi regime's ceasefire offers that might have been serious, but which NATO leaders reportedly rejected. They point also to strikes at fleeing Libyan troops that were posing no risk to civilians, or at strikes on buildings that had no military significance. They point to the killing of Gaddafi family members, which had little to do with civilian protection. They criticize the West's support for the rebels, its clear flouting of the UN arms embargo by su supplying the rebels with weapons, and the lack of measures to control the movement and the use of both these weapons and Gaddafi's own stockpiles, which meant <clears throat> the country and the whole Sahel region to the south were then flooded with heavy arms. And I'll come back to that in a moment to talk about Mali. The P3, France, um, UK, and the United States, sided with the Arab League's uncompromising pro-rebel position while appearing to dismiss the African Union's effort to negotiate a way out in Libya, 
which may have resulted in fewer civilian casualties. In the end, whether Russia, China, and others are sincere or not, they do make a plausible case that trust between council members was broken and that they were tricked into endorsing a military operation that actually had a hidden agenda. This further poisoned a context of continued wariness in the global south that Western powers exploit concepts like civilian protection and human rights as ethical fig leaves <coughs> for hard-nosed, completely self-serving policies. If the NATO intervention in Libya is seen as a military success, and it certainly is, I think, in most uh, NATO countries, including here, it was probably clearly also mostly a diplomatic failure. How much did the fallout in Libya underlie the Security Council's inertia in Syria? It clearly played a part, but the post-Libya paralysis of the Security Council conveniently obscures many other reasons for resisting precipitous intervention in Syria. Uh, Syria's position is considerably different than that of Libya's. Its internal divisions are much more explosive. Many in the region perceive their own fate completely intertwined with that of their Syrian proxies. Assad's military was always considerably more potent, uh, and even in its weakened position today, remains much more potent than Libya's ever was. And of course, Assad has many more powerful friends than Gaddafi ever did. In short, the recent impetus for the resolution of the conflict in Syria actually did not come from the Security Council, which is supposed to be the guardian of international peace. The US-Russia initiative to bring the parties together um, into the so-called Geneva talks is reminiscent of Cold War players taking charge, inspired possibly by the public display of Russian intelligence having alerted the US to the existence of the threat posed by the Boston Marathon bomber. If there is a mutual interest between the two, it figures prominently in Syria where the fear of radical Islamism looms larger every day. Now let me turn south to Africa briefly and to another conflict played out in the shadow of Libya, and that's the one in Mali. Early last year, three groups with links to Al-Qaeda seized control of the north of Mali from Tuareg rebels who uh, reinforced with weapons and mercenaries returning from Libya, where they had supported the Gaddafi regime, um, had already chased out uh, the Mali government troops. About the same time, officers in the Malian army, upset at its poor performance in the north, deposed the president and seized power in the capital, Bamako. Although regional and international pressure forced coup leaders to restore civilian rule in Bamako, the jihadi groups retained their grip over the north for much of last year as Western African nations so slowly uh, started preparing to deploy troops. The Islamist sudden march on the capital Bamako in January, however, prompted instead a swift military intervention by the French, which ousted them from the main population centers and restored some form of government control over most of the north. Last month, Security Council Resolution 2100 mandated a new UN stabilization mission to help the Malian security forces to support humanitarian efforts, protect civilians, and move along a political process and try to stabilize major population centers. Now, the stabilization mission, uh, that particular role of the mission, is now, it seems, part of a trend towards much more aggressive mandate for UN peacekeepers. Earlier this year, the Security Council also deployed as part of the UN mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo what it, it called an intervention brigade to pursue targeted offensive operations against the militia groups that are plaguing Congo's eastern provinces. Now, more aggressive military operations are driven partly by the legitimate concern for civilian protection. 
They are driven, driven to by the need to tackle these militias that are often protagonists in multiple and often intractable conflicts still plaguing the African continent. In fact, speaking earlier this year, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, was pointing to the remarkable resilience, progress, and actual prosperity in um, economies throughout Africa, but she warned that the gravest threat to the increased prosperity in Africa continues to be armed conflict. <clears throat> they are, however, serious risks in drawing UN peacekeeping missions into aggressive military operation. First, any offensive military operation inevitably increases the risk to civilian uh, populations and to producing civilian casualties. And the UN objective of protecting, protecting civilians could very quickly backfire. Military measures also tend to detract from the more vital but much more arduous uh, task of reconciling communities, nudging political leaders towards reform, improving governance, and building strong and inclusive state institutions, particularly in the security and in the rule of law sector. Ruling elites or regional and major powers may exploit peacekeepers' more robust mandates to try and wipe out armed groups that they portray as spoilers as criminals or as terrorists, but which in some cases actually do represent communities that have legitimate and often unaddressed grievances. Unless military offensive against militias are accompanied by political offensive against the conditions in which they flourish, UN troops will find themselves increasingly defending weak, unpopular, if not illegitimate governments over whose behavior they have very little sway. They may also sacrifice any trust that they must enjoy as impartial arbiters that can um, effectively mediate between the parties. Particularly troubling is that Mali and the whole Sahel look set to become the second, the new front on the so-called war on terror. Well-armed jihadi fighters remain with strong echoes of Afghanistan in the vast mountain ranges along uh, the Algerian border. The French will retain troops in Mali, or at least nearby, partly to protect UN personnel, but also to continue the fight against groups which have ties with Al-Qaeda. Whether such groups can be clearly separated from the local population is very unclear. Given the strong social, political, and economic ties between some of them and the communities um, in, which, uh, in the areas in which they operate, and also given their tactics of taking cover among civilians. Surveillance by drones is already underway, and drone strikes could potentially follow, despite the dubious uh, legality of these operations and their track record, particularly in Pakistan, of alienating local populations. The roots of the Mali crisis, like the roots of many countries' fragilities, lies less in terrorists or rebels, however destabilizing a role they may play, and much more in weak governance and political exclusion, as we detail in a series of reports we've published in Mali since the crisis began last year. The challenge is for the region and Mali's international partners to commit not just to Mali's territorial integrity and security, but also to shifting the culture of tolerance for poor governance, reconciling Mali's various communities, and more immediately, preventing forthcoming elections dividing the country further. In other words, the challenges, as elsewhere, are political as much as they may appear to be military. Last, I want to turn from Africa and the Middle East towards Asia uh, to escalating tensions in the Korean Peninsula but first to the danger that maritime disputes in the, uh, the South and East China Sea continue to intensify. China's expanding economic interest abroad should, in principle, mean that it has more to lose from upheaval overseas. Some recent signs um, also suggest that in the right condition, the US and China can work effectively together to promote stability. 
but China's rise may still pose challenges for the region. China and Japan, the world's second and third largest economies, are engaged in a standoff over a cluster of islets and rocks in the East China Sea that potentially offer significant strategic and economic value. China sees control of the islands as critical to accessing the Pacific. For Japan, losing them could curtail freedom of navigation and allow China to, a platform from which to monitor Japanese and US military activities in Japan's Okinawa prefecture. Reports suggest the possibility of large hydrocarbon deposits in the seabeds, though so far exploration activities have been limited precisely because of that territorial dispute. So despite complementary economic ties and both governments' declaration that they wish to avoid conflict and war, prospects for a peaceful solution of the standoff appears to be diminishing. The deep mistrust that for decades has marked relations between the two has not been held by more recent domestic developments in each. Top leaders have failed to set a conciliatory tone. Traditional diplomatic back channels have closed Experienced negotiators on both sides appear to have been sidelined. To prevent hostilities escalating, leaders in each country will need to temper their rhetoric. They should also provide adequate space and support for behind-the-scene diplomacy. Tokyo and Beijing need urgently to work towards establishing lines of communications and strengthening crisis management structures that have been unraveling for several years. Without careful and methodical action, both states risk getting drawn into a conflict that neither wants. China is also embroiled in maritime disputes with the Philippines and Vietnam, amongst others, over boundaries in the hydrocarbon-rich South China Sea. The lack of coordination amongst various Chinese government agencies involved in the area, which is, uh, the, these agencies are often described as the nine dragons stirring up the sea, hasn't helped. As in its standoff with Japan, China's quarrel with its Southeast Asian members uh, is tinged with nationalistic sentiment that threatens to overtake any attempt at more conciliatory approach. China's rivals, from their part, remain divided, which also hampers any search for a peaceful solution. Though repeated incidents have not uh, led to conflict since uh, 1988, they have crystallized anxiety about the shifting balance of power in the region. Without concrete steps toward joint management of hydrocarbon and fishing resources, as well as towards, a reaching, towards reaching a common ground on the development of an ASEAN mechanism to de-escalate incidents, pressure in that region could also boil over. At the same time, of course, tension is rising on the Korean Peninsula. The change of leadership in Pyongyang that saw King Kim Jong-un replace his father did not, as some had hoped, usher in any discernible shift uh, in the country's military-first approach to relations with, with its southern neighbors. Earlier this year, North Korea declared the 1953 armistice void in retaliation for ongoing joint military exercises by South Korea and the U.S. Last December, North Korea, in defiance of several Security Council resolutions, used ballistic missile technology to launch a satellite into orbit. North Korea's blatant violations of its international commitments and its vitriolic threats and provocations over recent months only serve to increase the likelihood of tension continuing to escalate. Seoul has matched Pyongyang's rising rhetoric, asserting that it will respond robustly to any threat from the North. What makes these developments in East Asia particularly worrying is that over the past two decades, war between, wars between states have been steadily on the decline. This may be due in part to our increasing interconnectedness, a global economy whose health shapes the well-being of all states and which makes wars between them less likely. The entrenchment of international norms and institutions, including the remarkable development in international humanitarian and human rights law, has also certainly helped. On the other hand, the virtual absence of interstate wars over the past two decades has coincided with a period 
of unparalleled unilateral power, essentially U.S. dominance. How the shift of power east and south in an increasingly multipolar world will impact peace and stability is yet unclear. Amid these changes, it's ever more important that traditional powers, particularly the U.S., seek to reinforce international institutions and cooperations. President Clinton once remarked in a very powerful display of American political rhetoric that the United States would be better served by the power of its example than by the example of its power. This may prove a very tall agenda as values that are perceived as Western are constantly being challenged and recourse to military might continues to be very attractive. In contrast then to the Mercedes S class or the soon to be Google translation glasses, the UN Security Council, the ultimate guardian of international peace and security, looks like a Model T Ford with no headlights. <laughs> Impotent in Syria, overextended in Africa, and irrelevant in East and North Asia, it is more than ever in need of reform. So let me end just with a few more word, words about crisis group. Our, our work in the conflicts that I've described in Syria, in Libya, in Mali, East Asia, are only a fraction of the work that we do on some 40 con conflicts across the world. Assessing our precise impact on policy can be difficult, given that policy is often made um, in obscure and through opaque processes. But I think it's safe to say that we shape policies in a number of ways, by ringing early alarm bells, by shedding light on less prominent conflict as well on high-profile uh, ones, by offering fresh thinking on intractable conflicts, by testing conventional wisdom and bucking orthodoxy, by exploring perspectives of poorly uh, understood actors, and by exposing new forms of conflict and new actors. For any of that to work, though, there is a fundamental precondition. First, you have to get the story straight. Uh, I've spent some 50 years, 15 years in the Canadian court system. Seems like it felt like 50. <laughs> um, you learn many things in court, but the, maybe the most important thing you learn is that there is not a single case that's just like any other. Understanding all sides, canvassing all points of views, eliminating superficial ready-made responses go a very long way. From legal doctrine to the resolution of a case, from political theory to the prevention of armed conflict, solutions must be grounded in accurate fact-finding and proper reasoning and analysis. It must be contextual, dispassionate, workable, and responsive to every complex reality on the ground, including, unfortunately, but often, the irrationality of human actors. It can be frustrating, especially when the obvious right solution is not allowed to work. At the International Crisis Group, this is what we do, and actually, often, it actually does work. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Merci beaucoup, Madame Arbour. My name is Antonia Maioni, and I am President of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Mon nom est Antonia Maioni, je suis Présidente de la Fédération des Humanités. Thank you very much, Madame Arbour, for your compelling remarks. We now have enough time for questions, and so I'd like to invite members of the audience, if they do have questions, to make their way to the two mics on either side of this room. And as you're thinking about that and moving towards uh, the mics, I have my own question for Madame uh, Arbour. Madame Arbour, in your um, speech today, and in your work uh, with the International Crisis Group, and the work that you've also done with the UN, Human Rights Tribunal, even on the Supreme Court of Canada. One word to describe you would be fearless. What is it, though, 
in terms of what you've laid before us as the main challenges um, in terms of armed conflict and the need to deal with crisis, not just in a post-conflict, but in a pre-conflict situation as well. What is it that, in fact, makes you most fearful about the future, and what gives you the most hope? Um, I think the most worrying part, which I, I think I went deep into the weeds, but the overall theme of what I wanted to exp expose is, at this stage, the surprising, um, I won't say mediocrity, I'll say modesty of our institutions. Uh, I think what, what allows us in a country like Canada, for instance, to be very resilient, despite the fact that we have very profound differences amongst ourselves on all kinds of issues, is that we have a fundamental trust in the institutions um, that allow us to resolve conflict, to, to, and not just conflict, our different aspirations, our different priorities. So this, I think the strength of institutions, it takes decades and decades to build them. They're not just mechanical, they're very cultural. Um, you know, if I, again, if I look at the judiciary, you would be amazed at looking at so many countries that are expected to function peacefully without a credible, trustworthy judicial system to resolve everything from family law disputes, uh, uh, property conflicts, uh, terms of small contracts, and so on. So, so to me, I think the, the most worrying aspect, again at the international level, is the current, um, I won't say dysfunction, but disappointing performance of the Security Council, which is still in the hands of the powers that reflect a world that has changed very dramatically. What makes me the most hopeful on the flip side is the amazing proliferation, engagement, and effectiveness of civil society actors. And again, maybe I'm preaching for a crisis group. You know, most young people start their career in NGOs, in nonprofit organization, and then they grow up and they join the UN or the courts. Or for some peculiar reason, maybe I, I was kind of sucked into the establishment prematurely. So now I'm returning to it. But I never cease to be amazed. If you look at the delivery, for instance, of humanitarian aid, even though you have an image of United Nations presence, I mean, if you go to Darfur, for each UN sort of staff member, there's 10 NGOs from, you know, Save the Children in Oxfam and Care Canada. There's a multiplicity of, uh, of civil society actors, people who pool together their money, their, their talent, their energy. And so there are these parallel structures. Maybe one day we could merge these forces without co-opting um, civil society actors into governmental institutions, but maybe increasing the synergies between mm -hmm. the two. Thank you. That is inspirational. Take our first question and then we'll move to the next mic. So I'm going to, oh sorry, um, we're not in Ottawa, we're in Victoria, but I'm going to impose House of Commons rules. And that is to say that your question should be 30 seconds long no or shorter. <laughs> Thank you, Madame Abreu, for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I just want to ask you, as a uh, um, you know, as one who has been in the center of these uh, of thinking about these conflicts in the world right now, what um, what sort of interfaces does the uh, international crisis group have? You mentioned you talked about the. Uh, uh, the non-governmental organizations, what kind of interfaces do, do you have with, say, like Médecins Sans Frontières, people like that, to, to actually effect uh, some sort of return to stability in some of these uh, fraught situations? The answer to that is not enough. Um, I think we're all, we all live in our own bubble. Uh, we actually have quite a bit of interaction on the ground. So our colleagues, I mean, Crisis Group is a field-based organization. So we have staff, actually full-time staff, in every bad spot on earth, bad in the sense of conflict-ridden environments. And on the ground, from uh, Kabul and Islamabad to Bogota to uh, uh, Dakar, we have a lot of day-to-day -day interactions. Uh, you know, these are small communities, and so all the, the actors, the international and local NGOs have a lot of interactions with each other. 
What I think we don't spend enough time on is in building smart, strong partnerships for, for instance, mass mobilization campaigns. In crisis group, we don't do that. Um, the, the work we do, the advocacy we do, is to, is, we try to address ourselves directly to decision makers. You know, we're not very good at save Darfur type campaigns. And maybe uh, we should do more of that. We should um, just engage and mobilize uh, in partnerships with a lot of different actors on the ground. Definitely we don't do enough of it. Uh, Madame Arbour, merci pour uh, votre communication. Uh, just to return to English, you were, you, you talked, you started talking by talking about technology in this Mercedes car, and you're talking about interstate conflict, but in terms of physical conflict, but I was wondering to get back to the theme of, of uh, technology, how you see the role of uh, cyber warfare and the internet, and given there's been lots of discussion recently about China and cyber warfare, including in Canada, I wonder what you see in terms of the, the possibilities and problems of, of technology and cyber technology, cyber warfare. Mm. Um, unfortunately, we don't do any of that work at crisis group as such. First of all, we have very limited means as a, a nonprofit organization. And every so often, we ask ourselves the question of whether we should transform some of our work to work a little more thematically. And we are now a 17-year-old organization, and we've always stuck to our very geographic footprint. So we don't do, for instance, uh, the stuff that think tanks do. We don't do big studies on, say, uh, conflict and climate change or conflict and gender, or conflict and technology. We do Libya, uh, Somalia, uh, Nepal. You know, we're very, very geographic. Usually we uh, figure that it would be transformative for us, and there's tremendous competition, I think, in these more thematic environments, and in this one in particular, in kind of cyber warfare. The field is almost entirely dominated by military intelligence and, and so on. So it would be very hard for us to deliver the same quality work that we do geographically to engage in that. But if you know a donor who has very deep pockets, <laughs> bring them on. <laughs> I would be prepared to reconsider. Oh, um, good afternoon, uh, uh, Madam Arbor. Uh, my question is uh, about Syria again. Um, <clears throat> My concern is that there's a lot of Russian oil interests in uh, Syria, and I'm curious as to your thoughts on how the Americans might be influencing the uh, rebels or helping the rebels um, because of their issue with the oil in Syria and how the Russians uh, might respond to, to that, and given they have a major naval base there as well. Thank you. Well, I, I think there are two sides to your question. One is what is the, on, on the Russian side and then the U.S. and others, and the U.S. are not the sole or, or possibly not even the main player on supporting the opposition side. In fact, most of the support, the concrete and a lot of the political support for various opposition groups, including the more radical ones, come from Saudi Arabia and Qatar, much more than from Western countries. The, the Russian interest, um, I think, comes in large part from a long-term association with Syria. It's probably the countries with which the Russians have been the closest on the ground. Most uh, uh, leaders, officers in the Syrian army uh, were trained in Moscow. They have arms supply contracts that they are unwilling um, to, uh, to forego. The Russians continue to supply arms to their regime. I was in Moscow last week. I saw the foreign minister on Syria for an hour. And I put a lot of these questions to him, and you know, at some point he said, we're not interested in arms embargo. Uh, the Security Council imposed an arms embargo on uh, Libya, and it's the Western powers that completely defied the embargoes and actually supplied arms to the rebels. We have contracts, he says, we have contracts with the government, and we intend to fulfill it. Um, on, the, on the other side, I think the, it's fair to say the opposition is, the opposition is very fractioned. Uh, the Western powers that are aligned uh, in large part with uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar in supporting various configurations of the opposition are very wary about some of the opposition groups, some of which are increasingly uh, radicalized, uh, um, have an Islamist agenda. One group in particular, al-Nusra, 
has been uh, labeled a uh, terrorist organization. So it's a configuration that, that I think is, uh, is very problematic for some Western powers. And then the Europeans are very divided as to the strategy uh, that they should put forward to assist the rebellion. Uh, there was, until very recently, an arms embargo um, applied by European powers. Europe was very divided as to whether it should lift it and start supplying arms to the rebels. At this present moment, um, I think it's fair to say that both the Russians dealing with the Assad regime and Western powers and some of the Gulf countries working with the opposition are genuinely, I believe, um, attempting to bring all these parties together for peace talks. The chances of success, I think one has to be very skeptical. Uh, it's a complex process, there are many, many actors, it's being pulled in every possible direction. But the conflict has now reached, I think, a level, um, and a level of complexity, and as I mentioned, a possible spillover into the neighborhood that makes it um, certainly worthwhile to invest whatever energy can be deployed to try to support eventually a ceasefire and what everybody agrees has to be a transition, possibly to elections uh, and a transition to, f to a different regime. It's actually very late in the process. The main objective would have been and should still be uh, to preserve whatever state institutions can hold the country together. The real danger is that this country will completely uh, break apart. Some argue that it could be just a division of the country between uh, the kind of Damascus region held by the regime uh, and other parts of the country held by the rebellion. That seems to be acceptable to none. Uh, the real danger is that the country would be fractioned much more profoundly with very porous borders, so with tremendous impact on Iraq, on southern Turkey, on Lebanon and, and Jordan, and of course uh, there's Israel's uh, enormous concerns about the fate of Hezbollah. So it's Currently, I think the peace process is, is probably the most hopeful, although um, elusive, um, outcome. Uh, Madam Abur, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the great work that you have done and that you continue to do and for your wonderful speech today. And I hope we shall have the advantage of the text of your message, which is so important. Regarding my question, it has struck me that the ghastly situation in Syria and the position of Assad, the dictator, just about exactly parallels the great play of Shakespeare, Macbeth, who waded through blood to power and met his fate uh, at the hands of Macduff, whose wife and children had been murdered at Macbeth's behest. I wonder whether you could comment on that. I feel it's on the <laughs> conscience of every one of us, uh, this terrible violation of everything that's human. And I wondered if you would be kind enough to make a comment about the tyrant and how he must meet his fate. I hope at our hands. Thank you. This is too tall an order for me. <laughs> I think I got this far by knowing my limits and, and not trying to bluff into something that I, frankly, I'm not particularly well equipped to handle. I'd be happy to hear much more from you about this, but I have zero to contribute. Uh, Madame Arbour, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation today and following her on what you have continued to do in your work internationally. Um, one Canadian we can be proud of. And on that note, I would, would uh, wonder if, or ask you if you could give a straight, honest assessment of the changing role that Canada has played internationally. Well, let me start by saying the fact that this question is put to me at almost every opportunity I have to speak to people in Canada, either publicly or privately, probably is part of the answer. It speaks for itself. There is, obviously, I think, in Canada, 
a, a, a perception that you're trying to validate or asking me whether the same perception exists outside the country that uh, either that foreign policy is not as central to Canadian identity as it has been in the past uh, is less well defined. I think it's fair to say that Canada is perceived, certainly from the outside, uh, to be absent. I think that's on a good day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think Canadians, certainly Canadians of my generation, and I, I suspect even uh, younger people as well, have continued to hold on to a self-image that was very anchored in Pearson's Nobel Peace Prize, um, this kind of romantic sense that, you know, you sew a Canadian flag on the back of your backpack and it's your ticket to safe travels and, and a warm reception anywhere in the world. Well, first of all, the world has changed, so never mind whether Canada has changed. That's not quite enough these days. But there, I think there is um, certainly a perception externally that Canada is no longer the convener that it used to be. There was certainly when I even when I started doing international work for the tribunals, uh, I don't know how to put it, it mattered what Canada thought on a particular issue because the perception was always that this was, um, that Canada was a bit, you know, was a consensual, searching for consensus, very much a convener. Now I think that the role seemed to have somewhat dissipated. Um, the fact of Canada not succeeding in getting elected to the Security Council, I think was telling, a telling moment uh, that uh, was not, I don't think it was a mere coincidence or just bad luck, you know, people lose elections. Um, sometimes uh, it's attributable to a series of factors, but I think this ab the absence of, uh, of a visible, strong, um, foreign policy agenda that has resonance and that reflects, I think, the identity that Canadians have, that we have amongst ourselves and are perceived to have as, you know, a successfully integrated community of differences, uh, which I think has so much to contribute to the management of differences uh, internationally, that seems to somehow have been lost in the conversation. Madam? Uh, yes, Madam Arbor, I would like to echo the thanks of other people who've already expressed um, similar... Uh, oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I just said that I would like to echo the thanks of the other people who've already expressed such sentiments to you. Um, you mentioned that your organization likes to shed light on less prominent situations in the world, and I did notice that from your... <coughs> from your remarks about Asia that you didn't mention Tibet. Um, this, there is a crisis there, sadly, less prominent in the world than it should be, and I just wondered what your views are, uh, are in terms of focusing more light on it and perhaps helping towards some resolution of what's going on there, which, although less prominent, is conflict nevertheless. Yeah, thank you. We don't actually... Uh, we, do, we don't do any work on Tibet. We have a very small presence in Beijing. Um, I mean, Tibet has been, uh, I think, um, viewed appropriately so um, as a human rights issue, raising all kinds of uh, human rights issues, ranging from uh, the fundamental right to self-determination to a whole range of violations. International Crisis Group is not a human rights organization. Um, and we work, in our work that we do with uh, China, is centered on Chinese foreign policy. So we work, we've published on China, Myanmar, China, North Korea, China, Central Asia, China in its neighborhood. Uh, but we, uh, there are many other organizations who uh, I think historically have been very engaged on that issue. We haven't done any of that particular um, kind of work. So we're going to just take a couple more questions. We have about uh, three minutes left. Uh, perhaps you could just have your question quickly and then Madame Arbour can respond in, in general. Okay. Um, did you not want to... Oh, there is someone there? Oh, sorry, I didn't... Oh. No, no, you're on. Okay. 
Uh, Madam Arbor, I just wanted to thank you, um, like the others, but as a peace and conflicts researcher and professional such as uh, myself, um, your career and work today is truly an inspiration. Uh, my question response is, is coming from your first response regarding the current state of the Security Council. I just wanted to understand how you would see um, a Security Council run by different states would be possibly better or more effective than the, than the current Security Council. I ask because China and India have demonstrated um, themselves or shown themselves as being extremely reluctant to intervene um, or to encourage international intervention in other states, fearing the same could be done for themselves. Thank you. Shall I respond now? Do you want to take another Yeah, go question? ahead, and then we have one yeah. more. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think, the, the first of all, the Security Council, there has to be a reform of membership. There's absolutely no question that the five veto holders, the so-called permanent five, uh, China, Russia, US, France, and UK, just don't represent on any measure, whether you, you look at demographics, uh, whether you look at the uh, emerging economies, whichever way you look at it, there are vast parts of the world that have a claim to being big international players that are not represented. There's been, as I'm sure you know, a lot of paralysis on the question of reform of the Security Council. The ones, these five that have a veto, are not about to surrender their veto, and they're not very keen to expand it to others either. Uh, so there have been all kinds of different formula with more permanent members and, and so on. But the Security Council, I think, suffers from this the very profound legitimacy crisis that makes it quite impotent. The second thing that you've pointed out, there is, I think, a, a tremendous tension, not just between these permanent five, US, UK, France on the one hand, and China and Russia on the others. There's a much broader kind of tension between the principle of state sovereignty, which is, is it's articulated in the UN Charter, the principle of non-intervention in the domestic affairs of a state. And that principle is championed by Russia and China, but also to the great chagrin of Western powers by a lot of uh, these new emerging powers, India, South Africa, Brazil, they are profoundly non-interventionist. And frankly, it's not, if you pay attention to what they say, it's not that they're petrified that they will be the subject of intervention, it's that they are very suspicious of the so-called altruistic motives of Western intervention. They just don't believe it. They think there have been too many instances of economic self-interest or political self-interest being pursued under or behind uh, a rhetoric of uh, protection of civilians, a promotion of human rights. They just don't believe it. There's a very profound uh, kind of breach of trust uh, that makes all these lofty principles of human solidarity and intervention to protect people at risk um, it's blocked by this suspicion. And that's why I mentioned how the intervention in Libya was once again viewed on the Western side as having done the right thing, you know, coming to rescue a people from its murderous leader and viewed on the other side with enormous suspicion. You know, we gave you a mandate to save the civilians of Benghazi and next thing you know, Three months later, you're still chasing Gaddafi's family, and the whole time what you wanted was re regime change. It's the same perception in Iran now with the nuclear talks. The reasons that this massive amount of sanctions on Iran, my view is unlikely to break the regime and bring it to, to surrender its nuclear uh, agenda, is that the regime, the Iranian regime, firmly believes that that's not the real issue, that what the West really wants is regime change, and that if they yield a bit, they're doomed. So I think we have a lot of uh, trust to be rebuilt, and I think starting with uh, reform of institutions where power would um, shift, I think, to some players who feel that they're not properly represented might be a way to start. Okay. Our last question, 30 seconds. Uh, hello, Ms. Arbor. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the role that civilian revolution plays in our world currently and ways that we as a society can safely supplement said revolutions. 
the Syrian revolution. Did, did Just you say? civilian revolutions in general, such as like the Arab Spring and. Yeah, I, I mentioned maybe if there is a, a mantra or an ideology in international crisis group is that everything is very contextual. So I'm particularly wary about drawing, and I'm not a big fan of uh, broad lessons learned where everything is interchangeable. Um, certainly in the, in the question of conflict management and conflict resolution, I think you have to be, um, you know, there's not one that's just like the other. I mean, they're ge general observations. Uh, one was before the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring, the sense was that uh, the most important thing in international politics was leadership. All these revolutions have been, in a sense, leaderless revolution. They were people... Uh, so a lot of stereotypes, I think, have been shattered. At the end of the day, does it tell you very much? I'm not sure. Uh, at the same time that we were having all these kind of Arab world uh, bottoms-up revolution, we had something that's almost as revolutionary in Burma, Myanmar, coming from the top. This was a top-down reform that is almost in the nature of a revolution. So what lessons do you draw? It's very hard to tell. We used to now, in retrospect, we say, you see, dictatorship does not uh, equal stability as we thought. Well, these guys got a 30, 40-year run. It's not so bad in political life. I think there's a lot of... A lot of democratically elected leaders would be pretty happy to get a 40-year run. <laughs> so, yeah, I think there are lots of very facile conclusions. At the end of the day, it doesn't tell you very much as to how to handle the next uh, challenge. Madame Arbeau. Thank you. It's rare. It's rare when the question period is just as stimulating as the as the uh, discussion that as your presentation that was, as we say in, in, in my uh, my students' generation, awesome. Um, I also wanted to say thank you uh, on behalf of the social science and humanities research community uh, for showing, I think, uh, in your remarks and in the work that you do, the importance of research, the importance of understanding context, complexity, understanding of. Uh, understanding how institutions emerge, consolidate, change, and the importance of civil society. So thank you very much. And I also want to say, couldn't think of a better way of kicking off our Big Thinking lecture series from someone who is not only a big thinker, but a big doer as well in the world. Thank you so much. We now have the official thank you from Rita Trombley. Thank you very much, everyone. I'd like to thank our partners, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, to Gilles Patry for being here with us this morning, to the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada, to the University of Victoria for hosting us in this beautiful auditorium and for making the participation of you, the community, possible in our Big Thinking events. I'd also like to uh, remind you that there is now a um, nice reception that is being offered by Royal Roads University, our education partner for Congress 2013, right here in the lobby, and you're all invited. I'd also like to mention that we, our Big Thinking lecture series continues uh, tomorrow with Danny Laferriere, Margaret McCain, and Ben Levin, and that also we have uh, the visit of Elizabeth May, the leader of the Green Party in the House of Commons, who will be addressing the Environmental Studies Association of Canada, the David Lamb Auditorium, that's in the McLaurin Building, that's the music building, at 2.30 p.m., and you are, the public is also invited to attend. Now I'd like to wish you a very good afternoon at our reception. Merci à vous tous. Bon après-midi. <laughs>